Hello, and welcome to this message from Pastor Skip Heidzik of Calvary Albuquerque. Our series called The War Is Over celebrates the songs from our worship team Battle Drums debut album, now available on iTunes, Google Play, and at battledrumsmusic.com. In this series, Skip looks at how these songs apply to us as we live in victory over sin. If you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can give online securely at calvaryabq.org slash giving. We celebrate that Jesus went to the cross and volunteered his life to pay for our sins. But this is more than just a simple concept. In this final message of our series, Skip turns to the future when we will become winners over the last enemy of life, death itself. We invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But before Skip begins, check out the sneak peek of victory. The war is over. Would you please turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We've been doing a series, and this is the last message in this series, where we are looking at the songs that our worship team has written, original songs, and we're giving what are the biblical foundations, the truths that are encapsulated in those songs. And the song is Victory, the one you saw The war is over. A little girl crawled up into her grandfather's lap, and they cuddled, and I can just say from experience, ain't nothing better than that. And this little girl, with her big blue eyes, stared up into Grandpa's face and said, Grandpa, would you please make the sound that a frog makes? And he smiled back at her and said, Rivet. Rivet. That little girl jumped out of her grandpa's lap, ran into the kitchen and yelled, we're going to Disneyland, we're going to Disneyland. And her mom said, what on earth just happened? What do you mean we're going to Disneyland? Why are you yelling that? And the little girl yelled even louder, well you said we could go to Disneyland when grandpa croaks. You know, for some people, death is an enemy. For other people, death is a friend. (laughs) The truth is, you're all going to croak. Unless the Lord comes back in our lifetime, all of us are going down. I don't know how you feel about that. But we are highlighting today a song of victory, a song of freedom. The war is over. And there's a lot of ways we could look at that truth. We could look at it as typically done by looking backward at the cross, noting that Jesus broke us free of the chains of sin. He has delivered us from the penalty of it. Or we could decide to examine that from a present tense, that the Holy Spirit is living within us, giving victory over the power of sin. But what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15 is he moves our gaze forward to the ultimate victory, the victory over death itself. 
uh, he neatly takes what has happened in the past and our motivation in the present, but has us look to the future. And the victory he writes about in this chapter is the victory that comes in the future by the resurrection, your resurrection. Eugene Peterson has written a book, and he wrote about visiting a monastery, interestingly enough. He said he was walking with the monks from where they were staying down toward the little cafeteria to get food, and he noticed the graveyard that they walked by, and there was one grave that had been freshly dug. It was open. There was a hole in the ground. And so Peterson said, so which one of your community has died recently? And the monk said, no one. That's for the next one. And it dawned on him that three times a day, every single day, three times a day, when they go to meal, they are reminded that one of them is the next one. I wonder who's the next one in this auditorium right now. One of us will be the next one. But notice what Paul does. At the end of 1 Corinthians 15 is verse 50 to 58, the final paragraph. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, did you notice there are 58 verses in this chapter? That's a long chapter. In fact, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is the longest most comprehensive chapter in all of the Bible about the resurrection, Jesus' resurrection and ours. And if you're wondering why so long a chapter, why so much literary, verbal real estate on that subject of the resurrection, there's an easy answer to it. The Greeks thought the idea of a physical bodily resurrection was utterly ridiculous. Why on earth? Once you have been released from your physical body, would you ever want to be reunited with that? And the uh, Corinthians were tainted by that belief. And so Paul breaks it down in this chapter. It's a very, very detailed and comprehensive chapter. You see, these believers had no problem believing in salvation. They had no problem believing that their spirits would go to be with the Lord. But a physical resurrection, they had trouble with that. By the way, do you know that you personally will have one day a resurrection? Do you know that you will literally, actually, physically rise from the grave? Your body will. I think that's good news, you know, because when we do, we're going to look a lot different than we do now. And in all the polls that I've read when these magazines ask the American public, if there's one thing you could change about your life, what would it be? Invariably, it's our physical appearance, our body type, our weight, our wrinkles, whatever. We want to change some physical appearance. Well, that is going to happen, and the Bible refers to that as glory or glorification. When you are glorified, we're going to go from gorified to glorified. Now, looking at this last paragraph, I want to give you four factors that point to our final victory. 
Victory is speaking of this victory over death in the future. Four factors that point to it. First off, our future requires our victory. Look at the 50th verse. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, that is our body, our physical body, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. In other words, our physical bodies are not suited for the future kingdom. This body just will not do. Go back one verse, verse 49. We, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, that's Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, that is Christ. Simply put, we're moving. And the place we are moving to requires special equipment. Special places require special equipment. We know this to be true. If you want to go into outer space, you need special equipment to give you oxygen, to take away carbon dioxide, to give you the right pressure. If you want to go down into the ocean, the same thing. You're in a foreign environment, you need special equipment. If you want to climb Mount Everest, special equipment. 200 people have died climbing Mount Everest in the past. Many have succeeded, 200 have failed. Special places require special equipment. Now, our present bodies, these physical bodies, are subject to disease, decay, death, decomposition. The place we are going to is not subject to any of these. That raises a problem. How can these bodies ever be suited for that place? Paul's answer? Resurrection. Just as Jesus rose from the grave and ascended into heaven, one day your physical body will have that victory, it is called. That's what he refers to victory as in this section. Now, we don't experience that victory here. At least I haven't experienced it of you. Have you looked in the mirror and just thought, oh my goodness, I am so amazing. <laughs> this is as good as it gets. No, quite the opposite, right? Uh, even I saw this uh, interesting documentary on aging supermodels. And aging supermodels, supermodels all come to one conclusion. Their career is very short. Because they only look a certain way for a very short period of time before they get shelved for the next one. And so, so this is good news. There must be a change, there must be a transformation, and the transformation will either be by physical resurrection or by rapture. Those are the two options, physical resurrection or rapture. Verse 51, behold I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's funny. There's a church that actually wrote that above their church nursery where all the babies are. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> That's out of context, by the way. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. Don't get thrown by the word mystery. It simply means here is new information. Here is information that hasn't been mentioned in the Old Testament, but I'm telling it to you by the word of the Lord now. That's all it means, new information, previously unknown information, and here it is. The information is simple. Not all believers in Jesus will die. Some will actually be alive when the Lord returns. And when he returns, there is going to be a transformation of the dead previously and the living at that moment. That's the mystery. That's the information. Our perishable bodies must at some point take on an imperishable form because of where we're going. So you can't take what you got to heaven. I said it was good news. I mean, listen, I, um, I don't want to look like this forever. Do you? You might be very young and svelte and handsome and beautiful and you go, I don't know, it's pretty good. 
just wait. <laughs> How is this gonna happen? How is this resurrection and this transformation gonna happen? Well, verse 52, listen to his language. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The word moment is the Greek word atomos. We get the word atom from it. But in the Greek it means something that cannot be divided, something that cannot be cut into. It is the shortest possible amount of time. That's what it means, in a moment, a flash. And he, he further elaborates on that. In the twinkling of an eye, what's the twinkling of an eye? It's not the blinking of an eye. That's about a one-thirtieth of a second. That's fast enough. But the twinkling of an eye is believed to be the time it takes for light to go from the iris to the retina of the eye. And that has been actually calculated as one-sixth of a nanosecond. So it's not a second, not a split second, not a nanosecond. One-sixth of a nanosecond in a moment in undividable moment of time, in the twinkling of an eye. All of that language Paul is using to say this will not be a long drawn out process. It's gonna happen instantaneously. Now when is this all gonna take place? Look at what he writes. At the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound. Now this is not the end of the world trumpet. This is not the last trumpet in the book of Revelation, the tribulation period. This is simply the last call for believers on the earth, announcing, trumpeting that Jesus Christ will come. Let me give you a parallel passage. It's kind of the same thing, but it's elaborated on just a bit more. It's the classic rapture passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. Listen to it. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Same truth. There's going to be some living, some who are already dead. Believers in Jesus, but when Jesus returns, some have died and some will be alive. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Harpazo. Taken away violently by force. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So he gives a chronology. There's going to be a moment of time in the future when those who are believers in Christ who have died will be instantaneously raised from the dead and those who are alive will be caught up together with them. So at some point in the future, the earth and the sea will yield up all the, de all the dust, all the atoms, all the molecules of all the decomposed believers. I know that's very graphic, but I want you to understand this and will yield them up, and there will be an instant transformation that takes place into a resurrected body, whether you're alive or dead at the moment. Now this brings up a question. It's a pretty simple question. It's, in fact, it's a very obvious question. Here's the question, why? Why would God need to do this? Why is the resurrection of the physical body such a big deal? Uh, why don't we just go to heaven in our spirits and kind of ethereally enjoy the presence of God? Why is it important that our bodies get raised? For two reasons. It's elaborated on in previous verses, don't have time to get into it, but I'll give you the two reasons. Number one, to reverse the effects of original sin. God said to Adam, in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. And we've been dying ever since. So to reverse the effects of original sin, requires resurrection. And second, the new environment you're going to demands it. Special places require special equipment. The millennial earth, the eternal state, you need a resurrection to complete your salvation and to inhabit the future kingdom. So our future requires our victory. Here's a second factor. The scriptures predict that victory. 
Look at verse 54. Paul says, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality. Now stop for a minute, because I know you've read these verses before and you tend to skip over this stuff. We all do. But it sounds like he's saying the same thing twice, right? He's not. We believe that this is actually is a category, speaking of those who have died, versus another category of those who are still alive. That's what he has been saying. So look at the first category. When this corruptible is put on incorruption, that is those who have died and are experiencing the decomposition that comes with death, they will put on in that moment, that twinkling of an eye, an incorruptible form. And then look at the second category. And this mortal has put on immortality, this living, breathing being, at the time Jesus returns, will also experience transformation, immortality. Okay. When this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now Paul is quoting from an Old Testament source. He's quoting the prophet Isaiah. When he says it is written, he's quoting the prophet Isaiah. Before I unpack that a little bit, let, let, me, let me tell you about a preacher. There is a preacher of the old school, but he speaks as boldly as ever. He is not popular, though the world is his parish. And he travels every part of the globe and speaks in every language. He visits the poor, he calls upon the rich, he preaches to people of every religion and no religion, and the subject of his sermon is always the same. He is an eloquent preacher, often stirring feelings which no other preacher could in bringing tears to eyes that never weep. His arguments none are able to refute, nor is there any heart that has remained unmoved by the force of his appeals. He shatters life with his message. Most people hate him. Everyone fears him. The name of this preacher is death. Every tombstone is his pulpit. Every newspaper prints his text. And someday every one of you will be his sermon. What Paul is announcing is what the prophets predicted. That one day... That preacher will be retired. One day that preacher will not have a job left. One day that preacher will go into that good night. One day death itself is going to die. That's the quote that he's making. When he says death is swallowed up in victory. Now Paul is making a reference I mentioned to Isaiah chapter 25. But also Hosea chapter 13. Allow me to read these to you. Isaiah, he will swallow up death forever. The Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. This is now Hosea 13. God speaking, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Now listen to what God says. Oh, death, I will be your plagues. Oh, grave, I will be your destruction. God is announcing to death, he's going to end it, he's going to destroy death. The language is strong, by the way. Death is swallowed up in victory, in verse 54. The word swallowed means eaten up, totally consumed. The prophets predicted the day when death would die. The stinger would be removed. Some of you who know church history have heard of a story called the 40 Martyrs of Sebasti. In 320 AD, the emperor of the eastern part of the empire named Licinius decided that all of his soldiers must pay tribute to the god he worshipped, the pagan Roman god, on a certain day. In the famed 12th legion of Rome, there were 40 soldiers who said, we will not pay homage to your god. These 40 soldiers were believers in Christ. And they announced to the emperor, you can have our armor, you can have our bodies, but our hearts belong to Christ. So he decided to make a show of them. He would march them onto a frozen lake. It was in the dead of winter. 
in the evening. He would strip them naked, march them to a frozen lake where they would be exposed to the elements and die through the night. 40 of them went out there. When they were out there on the lake, they began singing songs of victory. Victory. One of them even shouted back, death just ushers in our life. But through the night, one of these soldiers broke because the emperor said, if you only simply deny your Christ, I'll give you a warm bath and we'll take care of you. One decided that was an offer he wanted to take. So he broke the rank, denied Christ, got warm. So there's 39 who died by exposure and cold that night. In the morning, when the other Roman soldiers went out to bury the dead, they found not 39, but 40. 40 dead men. What had happened is there was an officer who was watching it all happen. And when that one came back and defected, but he saw the courage of those who remained, he decided that he would disrobe and walk out into the cold and confess Jesus as his savior and died with them. So 39 soldiers and one Roman officer faced death because the sting of death had gone. That's what verse 55 is all about. Look at it. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades or grave, where is your victory? Do you know that's a taunt? It's written in a poetic form. If you have a Bible, you can look at it on the page, see how it's indented a little bit, set like a poetry would be given. That's because it's a special form in the language. It's a taunting song. Some even believe that at the rapture, we're going to be singing that song as we go up. I don't know if that's true or not. Someone just supposes that. If that's true, better memorize it now. It's a short song. <laughs> it's a good thing to say. I mean, it's, it's fun, isn't it? It's like, nanny, 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 nah. oh, death, where is your sting? And it's just taunting death. Death is powerless. Dying holds no dread. The grave holds no grief. That's what's meant by it. Let me give you a third factor that points to our final victory. Our battles, now listen to me, you fight these battles, we all do. Our present battles anticipate our victory. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we've had a lifelong battle with our old nature, the flesh. I have, have you? I've always struggled with it. Ever since I became a Christian, the flesh and the spirit, Galatians 5 says, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary to each other. But the battle itself anticipates a victory. All battles anticipate a victory, right? I mean, somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. Whenever there's a fight, somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. Our battles anticipate our victory because we're on the right side. We're on the winning team. We're on the winning side. So though you experience hardships and battles and temptations and all that stuff, you're on the winning side. It anticipates a victory that is coming that is talked about here. Now, I want to I wanna unpack a single verse. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You see, death would have no sting at all were it not for sin. You know the one thing that makes people afraid to die, you know what that is? It's their consciousness of unforgiven sin. That's what gives the bite, the sting to death. You take that away, there's no sting, there's no fear. But it's that consciousness of unforgiven sin. Even the unbeliever has this stinging, nagging, edgy truth or thought that goes through his or her mind when they approach death. What if those Christians are right after all? What if I face a Christless eternity and my sins are not paid for and I stand before a holy God and I have unforgiven sin that has not been dealt with? What if they're right? That's the sting. That's the stinger that is in death. 
And then he says this, the strength of sin is the law. So death would have no sting were it not for sin. Sin would have no sting were it not for the law. Right? You know this by now. We know that the law of Moses came along. And when the law of Moses came along, all the do's and don'ts, the Ten Commandments, that didn't help our problem. That just articulated our problem. Because the law said, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And you look at it and go, oops, done them all. Failed, 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 failed. So the law comes along, doesn't help us. It makes matters worse because it clearly articulates what our problem is. I've told you before, a couple weeks ago, if you remember, that the law of Moses is sort of like a spotlight in a mirror. The spotlight shines on you and you see every flaw. The mirror is in front of you so you get a good picture of yourself. So you look in the mirror with a bright spotlight and you go, yuck. That's what the law does. The law makes you go, yuck. This is why for a person to say, I'm going to get to heaven by working hard and keeping all the laws and the rules is as dumb as saying, I'm going to clean my body by taking the mirror off the wall and scrubbing myself with it. It has no power to do that. It wasn't intended to do that. It was simply meant to show you the problem. So here we are. We as Christians experience this unique battle of the flesh against the spirit. But the fact that we struggle anticipates the victory. Why? Because Jesus promised eternal life to all those who have failed but simply trusted. You've sinned, you've fallen, you failed, yes, but you trust in Jesus. He's promised that it's going to end up in victory. That's why he says in the next verse, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. I got a call from a friend this week whose brother died. Just two days ago, his brother was killed in an accident. His older brother. And through the tears, my friend said, you know, Skip, I look at this as a mercy of God. Severe mercy. He said, my brother struggled with all sorts of activities. He was a believer. He loved Jesus, but he struggled with all sorts of activities. And I see the Lord taking him as a mercy, a severe mercy, because he's not struggling with those things anymore. He is facing absolute and total victory at this moment. You know, when some insects bite people, they leave their stinger embedded in the flesh. And it is well known that when they leave their stinger in the flesh, um, the insect will die because they're robbed of their sting, their ability to defend themselves, and they will naturally and quickly die. In a very real sense, death stung itself to death when it bit Jesus. It emptied all of its venom, all of its poison on him. And now the king of terrors is robbed of his terror. Now death is defanged. And whenever death is defanged, death is your friend. It's your friend. Isn't that what Paul said? For me to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. Death is your friend. Now we'll close with this. Look at verse 58. This is the fourth and final factor that points to our final victory. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, now Paul does this a lot. He, he loves to end great theological truth with a therefore. He's always the practical apostle. And simply put, theology should always lead to practicality. Information should always lead to transformation. And so the truth of the resurrection changes everything. First of all, Jesus' resurrection. If Jesus can do that, if that is possible for him to get up from the grave, then anything's possible. If dead people can live again, anything's possible. If that guy that we killed is now running around talking to people and ascends into heaven, if that's possible, then when he said, I will grant you resurrected life, that is also possible. So all of that to say, therefore, here's the truth that ought to affect the way we live. 
He says, be steadfast, be immovable, or stand your guard, stay at your post, don't deviate from the gospel. Now we're dealing with your own deep personal convictions. We all have them, we all have beliefs, you have beliefs, you have convictions deeply held. I don't know what they are, but some people's convictions are so deep and so long standing, they last about a month. I am so committed to Christ, I'm gonna follow him, but then the next month comes along and a little bit of trouble happens and, and they decide, I quit, I'm not coming to church anymore, I'm not reading my Bible anymore. He says, because of this truth, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I'll put it this way, don't stop reading your Bibles. Don't stop coming to church. Don't stop praying to God. Don't stop fighting temptation. Stand your ground. You know, actually you don't know when we're gonna die. You might think you do, but we don't. It's appointed on every man to die once. But barring the rapture of the church, it's going to come. I asked you a question at the beginning. I said, I don't know how you feel about that. Most people spend their waking moments not thinking about it, wanting to think of anything but that, trying to forget that. But there were two men, two buddies named Bob and Stan. Both of them loved baseball. One night at a baseball game together, they entered into a little pact. They decided that whoever dies first would send a message somehow from heaven to the remaining buddy on earth to see if there really is baseball in heaven. <laughs> well, Bob died leaving Stan, his buddy, to go to the games alone. And after a while, and it was quite a while, eventually, um, Bob managed a way to communicate with Stan on earth, and he said, you know, buddy, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news, there is baseball in heaven. You ought to see Mickey Mantle. He can hit a home run that goes a mile. Babe Ruth is running bases. It's unbelievable. This really is baseball heaven. And so Stan, with a big smile, thought about that, and then he just wondered what on earth could then be bad news. So he said, what's the bad news? And after a long pause, his buddy said, the bad news is you're scheduled to pitch up here tomorrow night. I don't know, I'm thinking that's good news. <laughs> Not bad news. If the sting is removed. Once the sting is removed and the venom displaced, bring it on. Bring it on. I discovered that possums, I don't like possums, but I discovered they're smart. I have my own reasons why I don't like them, but let me just tell you why they're smart. A possum will not go into an animal's hole if it only sees one set of tracks. It won't go in. If it sees two sets of tracks, it will go in. Two sets of tracks, one set means the animal is in there, two sets means there's something else in there with it, which displaces the odds a bit better. If he sees two sets of tracks, he'll go in. We don't need to fear death because when we look at the grave and we look at the tomb, there's another set of tracks that has already left. Jesus went into the grave. Jesus got out of the grave. He went in dead and he walked out alive. And because of that, he said, if I live, you will live. Father, thank you for the hope of the resurrection, not just Jesus' resurrection, but our own. These bodies will be raised, although they will be in a glorified state, they will look and act much different than they do now. We're so thankful for that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at that last trumpet transformation that lifted Paul out of the doldrums of prison and weariness of travel to say thanks be to God for such victory. I pray for those who may be here today who have not experienced that victory. 
there's still that nagging, burring edge, that sting of death. Death still has a sting. There is sin not dealt with, unforgiven, unatoned for, has not been brought to the cross. I pray for those, Lord, who may be trusting in themselves or in keeping rules and laws, rituals. I pray they would stop and turn and trust. Trust in Jesus that he's the only perfect life that ever lived and the only atoning death that ever occurred. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, that sting of death is still there. It's in your consciousness. You haven't given your life to Christ yet, or maybe you've wandered away from him and you need to come back. Why don't you talk to him right now? Why don't you do something about it right now? Why don't you say to him right where you're seated a simple prayer? I'll give you some words that I suggest you say to him. If you want to, you can say it inwardly. If you're bold enough, say it outwardly right where you're sitting. Say, Lord, I give you my life. I admit I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he died for me. He shed his blood for me. And he rose from the dead for me. Thus, death has lost its sting. I turn from my past. I repent. I turn to Jesus as Savior. I want to follow him as Lord. Help me. Help me. In Jesus' name, amen. Because Jesus defeated death and has given us eternal life, we should be steadfast in him. We want to know what truth from this theory stuck out to you and how you'll apply that truth. Email us at mystory@calvaryabq.org. And just a reminder, you can check out Battle Drums' album, The War Is Over, on iTunes, Google Play, or BattleDrumsMusic.com. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Skip Heitzig of Calvary Albuquerque.